Chris? No, no, Steve. We're not gonna we're not gonna be able to provide any any details on the names. Um, what we'll we will do, as as you've heard Luis say over the course of the past few weeks, um, and and me as well, uh, we will will not talk about people who are not on site with us. We'll uh, you know we'll obviously talk about uh, the players on the field who are at the facility or any players that have specific injuries. But if uh, if someone's away from the field for a non baseball related reason, we won't uh, we won't share any specific details about them. Okay, and I know that um, it's probably impossible to nail down, but do you guys have an idea of where and how the virus was contracted? We don't. <clears throat> I think what, what we're all learning is that this virus continues to have a lot more questions for us than, than answers. But, uh, you know, we, we do feel comfortable that, that the spread has not, uh, has not come from player to player or coach to coach. At this point, you know, our best guess is that it came from, from some outside, outside spot, but, but that is simply that. It's a guess. And uh, at this point, we just don't, don't know, and we may never know. In that situation where I understand you don't have an exact idea, but you feel like it wasn't player to player, is there anything that you need to or feel like you are going to reinforce or change protocol-wise from players when they're away from the field? Or is this something that, like you said, is kind of difficult to, to you know, just lock down entirely? Well, going, going back to the protocols that we set up during summer camp and then we've continued to follow over the course of the year, we, we've taken a lot of responsibility, personal responsibility and, and respecting one another in terms of our behavior, not only on site, but as we leave the ballpark as well. You know, I feel good about the way in which our players have, have handled their, themselves when they leave. You know, Major League Baseball has continued to evolve uh, with their uh, support in us executing the rules that we have, you know, additional monitoring that's taking place not only at the ballpark, but also on the road. Uh, so we feel good about what we're doing. And I know that our players take it seriously and, and we have a high degree of confidence that this, this uh, exposure that we received is not as a result of, of anyone misbehaving or, or failing to be responsible with their own safety. Thanks. Thanks, Steve. Next question is from Tim Britton. Hey Brody, uh, I don't know if you can get into this, but with the the player and the and the coach, are they symptomatic? Are they asymptomatic? Do you do you have information on that? For for both people, we're we're pleased that their their symptoms have alleviated. Both ultimately did become symptomatic, uh, but their symptoms have for the most part resolved, and the peak of their uh, of their challenges existed more within a, about a thirty six hour period of time for each of them. Uh, so we're feeling feeling much more comfortable about their safety, and you know while. Well, as I said before, there's so much that remains unknown. You know, our hope is that they're through the worst of it and that they can continue to recover quickly. And, and given that uh, someone on staff has it, will, will there be like a coaching move to get an additional coach in to help uh, replace whoever that is for a brief period of time? Well, yeah, I mean, w without question, we're going to have to make sure that we are staffed as an organization, but from players to support staff to coaches as necessary if we are in indeed going to be out. Uh, for any period of time with any one individual, whether it's a, a positive test or whether it's a close contact or, or any other reason. And then just kind of what kind of challenges is a team presented when it has nine games in six days the way you guys now have? It's a challenge, but this is a year that can't be about excuses. You know, we, we are not the only team that has faced adversity with scheduling. We're not the only team that's faced adversity with losing players or coaches for a period of time. And, and everyone has been faced with their own injury challenges. So we, uh, we can't be looking about what, uh, what we don't have or what our challenges may be going forward. We got to think about what we do have and find ways to be competitive with the schedule that we're faced with. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. Next question is from Tim Healy. Hey, Brody. Uh, amid all of this, I don't know if you even got this far mentally, but what do you make of the trade deadline being just a week away? Yeah, we're, we're juggling a few things right now, uh, all of us in the industry right now, Tim. And, you know, we have begun discussions. We've had a lot of conversations with different teams just about touching base and making sure that we're in contact with teams about you know, what their interests are, what their priorities may be. Uh, so that, that process has started, but we don't have anything on the horizon at this point. And from the time Thursday that you guys found out about this and that first game got postponed, what was that experience like to find out about the positive test, to make the decision to come home, to fly on the plane? Was the, what was the atmosphere and that kind of chaotic stretch like? It was sobering. 
you know, for, first and foremost, I think everyone was was concerned about the the health of of the two people. Uh, we were concerned about you know what we needed to do to to further test ourselves to make sure that none of the rest of us were were sick or were at risk. And then we had all sorts of logistical questions and challenges to make sure we could get people home safely at the appropriate time, continue our testing, and then start to contemplate what the future would look like for, for our own workouts and schedules. But uh, there were a lot of, a lot of moving parts, a lot, uh, a lot of uh, concerned people and, and a lot of people that were rallying together to, to put us in the best situation to, to stay safe and get back to, to business as usual. How many close contacts of the two positives stayed in Miami and are they still there? Yeah, we had, had four total close contacts that stayed in Miami and all four are in the process of returning to New York now. Gotcha. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Next question comes from Justin Toscano. Hey Brody, given that you said that you don't believe anyone misbehaved, you're confident in the protocols you guys do have and how you're following them, is it extra scary to know that you can do everything right and something like this can still occur? I think it reminds us that, that we're not immune to exposure. And it reminds us that the protocols that Major League Baseball has put in place, the efforts that we've taken as an organization are smart and they're the right ones. You know, when we started back up, I think there was an assumption and an ex expectation that, you know, baseball was going to be, was going to have positive cases. And I think that it's a, it's a tribute to what has been done, that there have been so few cases, but it's a reminder we're not immune to it. And we have to be smart and careful every day. And, and we, we can't let up because if we are lucky enough to only have two cases so far and uh, during the season and, and we don't have any more going forward, I think we'll consider ourselves very fortunate and be, be proud of the, the protocols that are in place and be proud of our ability to execute them. And when you guys learn of the news Thursday, how do you communicate that to players? Like what, what's your message to them just kind of in that moment? Well, we want to be, we want to be direct. We want to get them the information uh, as quickly as possible without alarming people, but also being able to give them direction on what we, what we were to do in that moment. And, you know, there were a variety of things that we wanted to do immediately, which was further separate players, make sure that we were, you know, continuing to, to keep any risk associated with with real-time exposure that, that we could avoid and then it was giving them information as quickly as possible to be able to direct them on what we were going to do in the hours and, and days ahead thank you thanks justin next question comes from bruce beck brody how did major league baseball do in handling this crisis in your mind we we were in total coordination and cooperation with them you know the you know, for, for better and for worse, Major League Baseball has had experience, you know, learning uh, about, about this, <laughs> this system and this, this virus. And it's that uh, education that they've already received that helped them mobilize us very quickly. And there was never a moment of time where we didn't have ongoing communication and they were able to help us make the best decisions that, that were possible at that point, uh, point in our in our process here so uh, we're very pleased with their leadership and they gave us a, a roadmap in coordination with with our team with our doctors and with other medical consultants to make sure we had a safe way home Brody do you think the major league baseball postseason should be conducted in a bubble yeah I, I it's too early to tell for me you know I would defer to major league baseball on, on what the, the best solutions are there I'm sure there are a variety of factors but you know I hope Hope that uh, and have confidence that we're going to be able to get through this season and, and hope that the Mets are a part of that postseason tournament. Thank you. Next question comes from Tony DeComo. Hey, Brody, what is your rotation plan now over the next six days? Yeah, good, good question. A little, a little to be determined at this point. You know, our guys were not able to work out at the facility Friday, Saturday, Sunday. We had very few guys were able to work out in Miami on Thursday because the information was coming in right as the guys were about to take the field. So we were a little bit back into the unknown, similar to what we were prior to summer camp starting, where each player had a little different uh, level of resources available to him when he went, went home. So we're going to get a better idea idea we're having very structured and staggered workouts where one pitcher will be on site you know working with Jeremy Hefner at a time and we'll have a much better handle on where each pitcher is by the end of today to be able to compare and contrast their readiness to pitch tomorrow and, and thereafter so once we get that work in 
and Jeremy and Luis can sit down and then we can try to develop some some game plan. But right now, the, the core focus is getting a handle on where each player's arm care is and making sure that they, uh, they're in a position, position to not only perform well, but also you know, protect themselves physically. Is your expectation that the two guys on the IL, Waka and Peterson, could, could come off this week? Uh, I don't know if it's our expectation, Tony, but we're we're hopeful that would be great. You know, to Tim's earlier question about the trade deadline, we do feel that, that we have a number of players that could be trade deadline type acquisitions for us. And, you know, Waka and Peterson are in that in that conversation, Jake Marisnik as well. You know, when you th we think about our needs, you know, being able to get some 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 more depth and, and more talent in the rotation and, you know, to get a right-handed bat that, uh, that can play in you know, multiple outfield positions. We have those guys just on the IL right now. And, and we felt like in, you know, in August when we got Hughes and Brad Brock back, uh, along with Gesellman, we got a real boost to our bullpen and the, you know, the sustainability of, of having those arms down there. And it's our hope that when, when we can get these guys back, we'll have a similar, similar feeling about it. And also one last one quickly, the two individuals who tested positive, how long do they need to stay in Miami for? Yeah, that's, that's still unknown at this point. You know, I know we want to, they're continuing to be tested every day. We want them to be in a safe spot, recognizing that, you know, they haven't been feeling very, very well over the course of the last two days. And we want to uh, make sure that they're feeling up to any travel and, and, of course, making sure that it's safe, not only for them, but for others around them. Thank you. Next question comes from Disha Dozar. Hey, Rody, does the upcoming pack schedule now make you apprehensive about taxing your pitchers and added injuries? And how do you plan to um, kind of face that challenge? Yeah, you know, Disha, I think that's a that's a relevant relevant uh, conversation that we're having. And you know, part of what we we did even leading into this is you know our goal is to start to stretch out a couple of guys so that we have more options to be bulk inning pitchers. And whether those bulk inning pitchers start games or whether they're tag teaming to get through five, six, seven innings of a of a particular game is something that we want to want to make sure that we were exploring. You know, it's only more important now when we're faced with playing multiple games and multiple do double headers in a in a single week. So that we're going to be creative in terms of how we how we deploy the guys. But the big picture is the more quality pitchers that we have that can pitch multiple innings in bulk type scenarios is only going to make our the rest of our back end of our bullpen that much better. And then just back to protocols, you touched on it briefly, but is there added emphasis now on players quarantining further when they're away from the ballpark um, just to make sure that they complete the season here? Yeah, well, right now we've been quarantining you know, here in New York effectively for the last last four days. Uh, the the road, we felt like there's been a bubble created every time we, we go out on the road. You know, it's very, very limited movements for, for all of us. You know, when we come home, there's always some some additional challenges because we, we go back to our families and our residences, but, you know, our behavior doesn't change much. I think we're all trying to follow the same uh, the same schedule that we do when we're on the road and make sure that we're putting ourselves in as best possible scenario where we don't bring in the virus any, anywhere else. But, you know, all of us are faced with these challenges um, across the league, and, you know, we feel good about, as I said before, the responsibility of the players and staff to to do their best to not expose each other. The quarantining in New York entail players staying away from their families? Yeah, so again, it, I think what we were doing the first few days is wanting to make sure that, you know, the, the six feet and masks rule, mask rules were being applied at, applied at home as well as not just going outside and, and exposing them to, to outside influences. So short version is, yes, the players, uh, players are being very careful at home with their families to, to continue to, to, uh, to separate and not put, uh, put themselves in, you know, additional risk. Thanks. Next question comes from Andy Martino. Brody, I, I know you probably have to be careful how you answer this and not reveal any identities, but what did you learn about why this didn't become an outbreak beyond, beyond the two cases? Because really the Mets and the Reds now are the two teams that have had positives and were able to prevent the full-fledged outbreaks like some other clubs have had. And why do you think that happened? Why do you think it remained so limited? First, we feel very fortunate at this point, and we, you know, whether we're we're lucky uh, or what the right word is, but we we feel fortunate that it hasn't 
hasn't spread any further than those two people. Uh, you know, the fact that those two people are exposed is is tough. You know, I don't want to underplay the significance of what that means for those for those two, but you know, from from the ability to contain it, I think it it goes back to the protocols that baseballs outline for us and the ability to execute those protocols you know the, we feel proud of the fact that we only had four close contacts for these two two people and that that alone is is going to limit the spread as far as what we know from a science standpoint and you know, being on airplanes being on buses and taking the extra precautions with masks and not eating or drinking and you know next to each other there's just a lot of different steps that that not only baseball's outlined for us but what we've tried to try to follow as well that uh, that have put us in a position where our close contacts are limited and hopefully the spread is limited as a result of that. So the like in lay terms, the four close contacts means that these two individuals were positive when you did the contact tracing over days, several days without them knowing they were positive, they only had close contact with four other people in the organization. That, that's correct. And, and even within those four, uh, we went to the abundance of, a, of caution to overly consider close contacts and i think all four could could arguably be uh <laughs> they probably would like to have not been in close contacts but arguably could have could have said that they didn't really qualify but we wanted to be be overly careful and cautious so that we could limit this as best as possible thanks thanks andy next question comes from wayne randazzo hey Brady, just to be uh clear are the two people that tested positive experiencing symptoms and has it gotten serious enough to consider hospitalization or anything like that the the latter part of that question is is no they they're not uh not experiencing symptoms that would warrant consideration for hospitalization so both uh both people are you know effectively re resolved from most of their symptoms and you know still are are feeling not 100 percent in terms of energy level but you know, knock on wood, they're through, they're through the primary symptoms. Next question comes from Steve Gelbs. Hey Brody, I have two quick ones. Um, when it comes to contact tracing specifics, uh, I mean, you know, obviously I could be wrong, but the assumption would be that these two individuals outside had some potential close contact with, with people without masks on in the course of games. Um, when you guys contact trace, is there a emphasis put on close contact indoors versus close contact outdoors where the virus seems to be less likely to spread? Yeah, we didn't, we didn't discriminate between the two. You know, we wanted to contact trace indoors, outdoors, you know, at home, away, you, you name it. We wanted to make sure that we were exhaustive and considering each of those factors. Um, so, you know, no, Steve. We wanted to make sure that we were uh, we were covering both both cases. Okay, and then uh, I know you you don't have specific plans when it comes to um, when it comes to the rotation, but given the need for starting pitchers, is Stephen Matz an option to rejoin the rotation potentially? As I as I said before, you know, having having pitchers who can cover bulk innings. Uh, are important to us and whether that is you know any one particular pitcher starting the game or whether it's someone coming in after the game we have to be creative at this point you know call it openers call it bulk inning pitchers you know I have a feeling that we're probably going to be going through a num number of different scenarios uh, not only this week with the number of games that we have but also as we head towards the you know the rest of the regular season because we have to treat each game as as much of a must-win game as possible and that's going to require us you know calling on people that maybe we haven't called on before or asking people to perform roles that they uh that they maybe haven't done before and i think that's that's the way we would envision you know steve you know he may he may well need to be you know a starter that we count on but i know he's going to be a pitcher that we're going to want to count on and so that's something that uh, that won't change and you know our our expectation is that we'll try to keep him stretched out as much as possible to fill either role next question comes from tim Britton. Who does the contract tracing? Who's responsible for doing the, the legwork on that? Yeah, a combination of a lot of people. You know, the Major League Baseball has an investigative process that they conduct. Uh, our medical team has uh, a process where multiple people are reaching out to identify the contact tracing. And it goes all the way down to, to myself in terms of things that I have seen or witnessed or and then our players help helping to self-police themselves you know wanting to make sure that everyone memories can sometimes be tough 
So the more people that we can involve in um, in identifying these close contacts is is important because you know the you don't want to miss anyone and you know having everybody collectively try to try to work together was important at least from the way we handled it. And then, and then those four people that that stayed in Miami a, a little bit longer, how are they getting back to New York? I've seen other teams they've been driving back. How are those guys getting back? Yeah, I mean I won't go into the details of of their travel plans, but uh, but we're we're keeping them socially distanced and we're trying to put them in a scenario where not only are they safe from others, you know, within their traveling party, but but also you know not putting themselves in any additional risk as well. So they're they're working their way back, and you know our hope is that they can you know get back here at some point tonight. And then last one, uh, you know, with with the Yankees being in the same town as you, was there any consideration to playing one of this weekend's doubleheaders at City Field to kind of even the the home road balance there at all? Yeah, we we worked with Major League Baseball on the scheduling, and you know the the way it worked out in, in Major League Baseball's you know ultimate. You know, as you saw, the scheduling of the games, we're going to have five of those games at their at their ballpark. But, you know, we we'd always like to play every game at home, you know, whether it's this series or any other. But, you know, we're uh, we're prepared and, you know, I, we're going to get two of those games this weekend where we're the home team. And so, you know, we've we've got to be prepared to play everywhere. And, and that's uh, that's going to be our, our focus and not worry about whether whether it's at City Field or or Yankee Stadium or any of our other road games. Do, do you know which two you will be the home team yet? Which two of the games, as far as yeah. first like or this, second this, game of that particular day, I don't. Yeah, okay. Thanks. Next question comes from Dan Martin. Brody, you talked a little bit about the uh, conversations you guys were having with about the upcoming trade deadline. And I was wondering how the uncertainty of this season might be impacting your approach to the deadline, just because you don't know from one day to the next who's available. And, and like you even said before, the postseason, you hope, you hope baseball gets there. So how, how does that uh, weigh on you? It, it weighs in a variety of different ways. You know, I think first and foremost, you know, we experienced just even with these two positive tests, how quickly needs might change or uh, players or, or coaches or roles might, might need to be filled. Uh, add on to that the, you know, the inevitable injuries that guys face on, on a daily basis. So there's always going to be a lot of transactions that take place that, that are unexpected. And so uh, there's first and foremost, what are our needs as a team at any point in time could change quickly between now and, and the end of the end of the month and the August 31st trade deadline. Uh, the other factors that we have to consider are, you know, short-term upside to the roster, longer term control for players that could help over multiple years and then ultimately what the acquisition costs are for each of those each of those different situations you know we're going to be very careful you know i i think that the aggressive approach that we've taken in the past is not something that um, we will uh, eliminate from a possibility but you know we recognize we've got a 30 game season effectively and less than that once the trade deadline comes and goes and so we have to be responsible for the future of the organization while still being opportunistic for ways to improve improve the club but uh, you know I wouldn't I wouldn't see a rental player uh, for us or anybody else commanding uh, you know a, a huge return in terms of prospects and I think teams will be more conservative overall but we haven't necessarily identified what the marketplace is for the short term players and I know the the longer term players every year that a that a player has a control or the or the higher impact that player is is going to create a, a higher higher acquisition cost so we'll we'll blend all of those all of those factors and and ultimately try to try to make make moves that that fit our goals but we're not going to feel like we're in tremendous pressure to make a move just for just for the sake of making a move you know, we feel like we've got some depth on the team. We feel like we've got some guys returning to health that can help us. And if there's something to, to do in the short term that gives us you know, some degree of upgrade over a particular position, then we'll look to do it. But we're not going to do it at the sacrifice of, of, uh, of our long-term goals. Next question comes from Mike Vaccaro. Hey, Bertie, I'm curious. Uh... What your reaction was when you first heard about Major League Baseball's move to seven inning doubleheaders, and if that's changed at all by the fact that you're obviously going to uh, be, be inundated by them now, and what that means to you in terms of uh, whether it's a good thing, a bad thing. I assume you think it's a good thing now, but I'm curious how that has evolved in, in, in your way of thinking. Yeah, well, I, I think all of us that, that have spent any time in baseball like the the tradition of the game and, and feel that there's some 
uh, some value in having having some consistency from from year to year and, and game to game. Um, at the same point, you know, I think we all recognize that this season was going to be bringing new new challenges and have to look at things in different ways, primarily for for the health and safety of the players. And so the rule changes that were put in place, I was in favor of. And then once the seven inning games came into effect and we started seeing the challenges that that baseball and individual teams were facing with so many games in a short period of time, it uh, it may seem to make sense. Now, as we look at it from a personal standpoint, it I think it's a, it's a necessity. You know, trying to cover you know so many games in so many few days or such few days, you know, it's a, it's a challenge for everybody, and not just us because we're playing the games, but our opponents who who are you know faced with the similar similar structure. So um, you know, right now we're in a position where we only have four games to make up. And you know that that may change as it, time goes on. We know we're not going to be playing you know fewer games as as we go. We know that it's only going to be you know more uh, more challenges. But right now, the seven inning games give us a chance to at least start to map out what we could potentially do in terms of pitching over the course of these days. Next question comes from Tim Healy. Just to follow up on the contact tracing questions, you mentioned that in an abundance of caution, the bar was sort of lowered in terms of what was deemed close contact. What was the standard used for that? Yeah, you know, I think publicly, you know, the, the general rule of thumb is you know, stay six feet away for, for less than, or you know, don't be within six feet for, for less than 15 minutes. Um, I'm sorry, for more than 15 minutes. Right. But we, we've always taken the approach from the beginning of summer camp that, you know, if we can be more than six feet away, let's do it. And so anytime real estate allows for us or square footage allows for us to be farther apart than that, we encourage our, our players and staff to do so and, and definitely want to limit, you know, our time to far less than 15 minutes and, and only keep, you know, multiple minutes of contact to, to a rare minimum based on circumstances. So um, we took that approach and, you know, we, we kind of built from there. So in deciding who was a close contact in this scenario Thursday, was it 10 minutes within six feet? Five minutes? Yeah, yeah I'm, Tim, I'm not going to get into the specific details of it, but um, we did not have anyone that was in contact with one another um, within six feet for, for longer than 15 minutes. But we wanted to make sure that we were capturing everybody that possibly could be, uh, could be dangerous. Thank you. Brody, thank you very much for your time this afternoon. Thanks, everybody. Stay safe. Look forward to getting back and playing games.